Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for sticking with us throughout the day for these fascinating conversations. We have made it to the final roundtable of the day. Uh, I'm Susan Evans McClure. I'm the director of our food history programs here at the National Museum of American History. And we're wrapping up the day by talking about the politics of health with this incredibly accomplished panel. They'll be talking for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes of questions. If you want to ask a question, and we hope you do, you can tweet your questions using the hashtag SmithsonianFood, or if you'd like to stick to paper, you can hand in the cards that you have in your hands, write your questions on them, hand them in to the ushers who will be picking them up. And then Jessica Carbone, Jess, you want to say hello? We'll be compiling the questions and asking them of our panel. And as you are telling everyone how amazingly mind-expanding this day has been, um, you can use the hashtag SmithsonianFood to do that and to follow along. And several of our speakers will be signing their books outside of the theater right after the panel. The full list is in your program. And for those of you that have now heard me say that four times today, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Helen Zoe Veit, who's the Associate Professor of History at Michigan State University. And Helen, take it away. Great. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be moderating this panel. I think all of the panels today have been intersecting with the question of health. Um, it's so crucially important when it comes to food, and I am so excited, I hope you are too, to really dig in for the next hour. I am joined by three extremely distinguished panelists. Um, first is Rock Harper. He is, has had many careers. I will just touch on a few. Uh, he is now executive chef at Howard's Theater, which is a restaurant in DC. He is the author of the book, 44 Things Parents Should Know About Healthy Cooking for Kids. Um, he has been on uh, reality TV cooking shows, and he is the winner, of, for example, of uh, season three of Hell's Kitchen. I hope we'll hear more about his incredible <laughs> life. <laughs> Next is uh, Brian Wansink, who is a professor at Cornell University, where he also runs their food and brand lab. Um, he has an endowed chair there. He's also the former executive director of the USDA's Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. He is also the architect of some of the most creative experiments I know when it comes to why we eat what we do and how we eat it. My students love, among others, his experiment where he put people in front of soup bowls that, unbeknownst to them, were automatically being refilled through a tube underneath the table <laughs> to measure how much they ate and if they ate more. And indeed, they kept eating and eating and eating. Um, Many others as well that, are, that really, I think, illuminate the environmental cues that affect how we eat. Um, finally is Elizabeth Hoover, who is an assistant professor of American Studies at Brown University. Um, she is right now finishing a book called The River in Us, Fighting Toxins in a Mohawk Community. She's also already at work on a new book about indigenizing the local food movement. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to all of them. I want to start, as we think about health, by asking how our notions of what is healthy have changed over time. So I guess I could start. Um, first, in thinking about how do we define health. And so all day, I think we've assumed that by health, we mean physical health. Are you getting enough nutrition for cellular turnover and for a body that functions properly? But there's also social health to be thought about in food consumption. And so the individualized diet model doesn't work in all communities if you're the only one eating a little Jenny Craig meal and everybody else in your family is still eating um, food that might be considered kind of high fat, high sugar. There's cultural health. So are communities given access to the lands that they need in order to be practicing traditional farming, gardening, hunting, fishing methods? Um, there's the spiritual health that goes along with that, and there's what Melissa Nelson calls eco-cultural health. And so is the landscape healthy enough for you to be able to eat off of it, and vice versa if people aren't out there practicing these traditional methods? Is the landscape as healthy as it would be otherwise? And so I think that's something to, to keep in mind as we go forward, that there's different models and different ideas of what constitutes healthy. And in trying to get people to eat healthy, you know, how do you bring the whole family in? How do you make it culturally relevant if you're trying to get people to have a certain nutritional component to their diet. I think that sustainability notion is a really, really good one. I was going to look at that from more of a, just a personal standpoint. And I think there's been three major sort of 
evolutions that we have seen or think we will see in our definition of health. And the first was a number of years ago when it was simply sufficiency, calorie sufficiency. Ooh, we, don't, we don't want to starve. I mean, there were a, a huge percentage of people in World War II who were determined to be um, unfit for service to malnutrition. So I think that was the first revolution. Now we're at the revolution of how do we get sort of the right sort of balance of calories and also nutrients. But I think the third wave or the third era of this evolution is going to be psychological health. And I, I like it that you touched on that because the psychological health is the fact that we've become really disconnected from our food. We've become disconnected from the people we eat with. And I think at some point, the powerful reinforcing effect that food can have on our lives is being totally lost because we're just seeing it as essentially gas to fill our tank. I don't know if I can uh, you know, <laughs> follow those two answers up with anything more, but uh, from, from a chef's perspective, I believe that um, you know, people ask us all the time, how do, how do we eat healthy? And uh, culturally, we sort of hit with um, a bunch of sugar, fat, and salt and uh, eat more and more and more. Uh, but people want to have great food, and we want to uh, we want to live, and we want to, you know, we want to eat what we call healthy. One is determining what what actually is healthy. I think that was really important. We talked about it early because everything doesn't work for everyone. Uh, the the other thing is, um, you know, which is really important to me is access to, to, uh, and I know we'll talk about that later. But to be able to uh, to eat um, healthy, the choice. This is America. People people want, you know, choice and transparency. Uh, so. One, it's it's what is it? What is healthy for me and my family and my community? And then two, if I want to eat a twelve piece of fried chicken, I should be able to. But also, if I want to eat, um, you know, organic vegetables, I should be able to as well. So, um, I think it's really important to have uh, access to it. So this is, I think, touching on one of the biggest issues when it comes to health is equity and access and affordability. There's widespread. There's at least a widespread perception that to eat healthy, you have to be, you have to be fairly affluent to, to eat really healthfully. That healthy food is more expensive. You hear that all the time. First of all, is that true? You know, is or is that you know, as, as some people have begun to say, a myth. If you're actually cooking, can you actually eat fairly healthy in your own home? What about um, how the cost of food shapes our perception of healthy? For example, the elevated cost of organic food. Um, how do you think cost through things like taxes on sodas might affect our perceptions of their healthiness or not? And what about subsidies, which um, you know, overwhelmingly go towards corn and soy, which are the basis of processed foods in our food system? Um, so what about food and cost? I think that the, the, when we say cheap food and expensive food, you know, there's, it's, it's, a, it's an illusion, I think, in a large part. Um, that you know the impact of the products that are, are cheaper and more expensive on the on the planet even in, in our system, we, we say that organic food is more expensive, um, and with the subsidies, it's just not to me. It's just not true what really is cheap as it as it impacts us sort of as a as a you know a broader perspective. Um, you all are probably you know you can put it w way better than I can, but I just think that cheap food. Is, is really not cheap. It really costs us a lot, whether it be in healthcare, on the environment, um, and the people that can afford this cheap food, right? If you talk about some of the, uh, the cheaper fast food options, um, how, how we all pay for everyone consuming this on a regular basis. So it, in turn, it, it really becomes more expensive. And why is it so cheap? Um, and why isn't the, why isn't the organic stuff uh, cheaper? I think that could happen, um, but right now it doesn't exist. Yeah, and I think as a perspective builder, if we look back to 1960, when our moms and dads went shopping, they spent about 26% of the family budget on food. Well, now when we go shopping now, we spend about 6%. I mean, it's ridiculous how little we spend. And I think nobody wants to kind of turn things back and make food more expensive. So we're doing a lot better than we were 40 years ago, or 56 years ago, I guess. But I think the second thing that needs <clears throat> to be considered is that I mean, you're from Michigan, and I love Michigan cherries. And, and they're a great buy in August. <clears throat> but if I want them in January, you're gonna cost, they're going to cost a fortune. And so, yeah, healthy food is expensive if you buy it at the wrong time of the year, if you buy it at the wrong place. If I buy an apple at 7-Eleven, it's going to cost me a whole lot more than if I buy it at 
a supermarket, for instance. And so <clears throat> is it more expensive to eat healthy? If you do it stupidly, yes, it is. But if you look at frozen vegetables, you look at rinsed canned vegetables, you can eat tremendously healthy, but not very much. And I think it's important to look at the social and economic construction of landscapes. So we've heard today about food deserts and food swamps. Um, indigenous people got a lot of healthy food out of deserts and swamps for eons. So, <laughs> <laughs> so by, by picking natural landscapes and, and applying that to communities that don't have access to food, it sounds like a naturalized process. So let's call it what it is. I mean, they're, they're food wastelands, they're food brownfield sites to borrow from environmental regulations. <laughs> These are constructed sites where people don't have access to the food or it's very expensive to get that food. And so, you know, there are many programs within indigenous communities looking to try to reconnect people with gardening. There's urban gardening projects. There are ways that communities that don't have money and don't have access to be able to shop at Whole Foods are working to get that access and counter these constructed landscapes. You know, actually, can I, if I can Please. go back, I, just, I, I had an interesting experience. This is, this is about 10 years ago. It's when I was uh, the executive director in charge of CMPP is that uh, Tom Harkin, the, the former senator, kind of challenged me and he said, you know, I challenge you to live on the amount of money that it would take to uh, feed your family for a month if we were in food stamps, a family of five. It's like uh, 400 bucks or something, something like $420. And so we, we said, well, let's do that as a challenge. And so we initially started off like eating you know, hamburger helper with half as much hamburger in and you know, just trying to be really careful. And after about, you know, we didn't drink wine at mealtime and stuff. You know, we'd go to all the church potlucks and just <laughs> eat up, kids. You know, <laughs> there's no breakfast tomorrow. And, and what we found after about two weeks was that actually it wasn't quite as difficult as we thought. We ended up buying a whole lot less processed food. But then also, I know how to cook fairly well, too, so um, hamburger helper. Hamburger helper. <laughs> Grew up one. <laughs> I mean, how, how important do you think cooking is to being healthy? So cooking is, is extremely important to being healthy, and... Here's one thing like, you know, there's been a, a lot of famous uh, or, or um, a notable uh, challenges like the food stamp challenge, and I think Mario Batali did one. And, uh, you know, I was on, my, my family was on food stamps when we were younger. What, what those, I guess those, those challenges don't take into consideration is a single mother of four that is working two, three jobs, okay. and, and maybe the lights are out, right? So, and maybe, there isn't this structure where you can, maybe there isn't a stove, right? I, I work with a bunch of chefs that go into, you know, um, the projects and teach um, low-income families how to, you know, garden and cook. And you just have to be sort of mindful that sometimes there is no, you know, people are, don't have running water in some of these places and don't have the education on how to, how to braise or, you know, where do you go to, or a peeler, like, I mean, that's a real thing, or a knife, a, a chef's knife, or, you know, so cooking is extremely important, but when we, we have to remember that the bro, you know, it's not just, okay, let's give them a garden. Who's going to take care of the garden, right? So, it, you know, if she's working two, three jobs, and, and you know, one job is on her for, for not having uh, uh, child care, she can't get, where's, where's the time to pick the vegetables and to cut them and to make this meal? That takes time, so we are talking about going back in time, but Right now, it's just, you know, we can't go from here to there without taking into consideration some of the other factors. So uh, cooking is important, but we got to make sure people have the time, the money, uh, and the opportunity to actually cook. Thinking about poverty and food, um, one of the stunning developments of the early 21st century when there is an unprecedented abundance of food and an incredible amount of food waste is the staggering number of Americans who live with hunger. Um, approximately one in 10 Americans deal with hunger. Uh, it's actually slightly more. Um, and about one in five <coughs> children experience chronic hunger, food insecurity. How do we explain this? How do we deal with this? And and there is also a sort of twin problem, which is the problem of obesity. And although it's very counterintuitive, it's often the very same Americans who are obese who deal with chronic hunger. So, so th I, this is a larger question about poverty and food today in America. And again, I think we need to look at the historical and social 
ways that have led to that. So in American Indian communities, scorch earth battle tactics were used you know, from the Washington's Army Sullivan's campaign against Haudenosaunee people on up through the intentional slaughtering of buffalo as a way of intentionally making American Indian communities hungry to weaken them in, in power. And then that food was replaced with rations, which were nutritionally insufficient and foreign foods that people were not used to cooking with. And then that was sort of replaced by the, the commodity program in the 30s, and then you have the food distribution program on Indian reservations in the 70s, where you have foods that just were, did not have the same nutritional components as the foods that people had been gathering off their own land before this invasion and colonization. And now the Dipper is working on trying to include better foods in those food packages. And so they're, they're working, they just included wild rice into some of these packages that are going out to American Indian families. And so we're working on trying to amend that. But just in thinking about hunger in American Indian communities has been a very politically intentional tool for a long time that now programs are trying to make up for. And now you know, the highest rates of diabetes, obesity, and childhood hunger are suffered in American Indian communities. So there's a lot of work to be done there to counter all of that um, and, you know, historic trauma that's led to the health problems that people have today. You know, something I think is interesting is that both of those, the obesity problem and the, and the hunger problem, I think have a similar connection. And that's what happens to somebody when they're no longer food insecure. And what our research has been finding is that they still act like they're food insecure. And I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the things that we found is that uh, when we bring people in for lunches and stuff like this, we'll find that people who had been raised on some sort of food um, assistance growing up tend to eat a little bit worse at a buffet than somebody who doesn't. But this is now years later when they're doing very, very well. And you can see why that happens, because one of the studies we did is we took people and we didn't give them food for 24 hours. They had to go on a 24-hour fast. We brought them come in to eat. And what we find is that if you haven't eaten, you don't necessarily eat more than the, than the guy next to you who ate four hours ago, but you eat terribly. It's all carbohydrates that you end up eating because it gives you that fast energy. And I think this ends up being the problem when those people in food insecurity become food secure, is they don't change their eating patterns. Uh, so with poverty, um, Washington, D.C. is where I am. And, you know, the, 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 the gap, right, you know, there's so much, uh, what do you call it? There's a lot of buildings going up. What are we? There's develop, developments. Um, and it's wonderful. I love this city. It's been great. Uh, but the gap as far as, you know, the people are getting poorer and people are becoming, uh, they, you know, we, we throw away a lot of food in this city as far as, um, you know, just, we just, there's a lot of waste, right? So the gap is, is some people doing really well, and there's a lot of people that are doing much worse. We have a, a homeless problem here. Um, and that's sad to me because, you know, it affects uh, people of color disproportionately, uh, especially in this city. So why, the question to me is why are people hungry? And it leads to, nobody wants to be broke and hungry and, and, and you know, begging. And on nobody wants most people don't want that, so it's it's opportunity to have access to purchase good food. I want to have a good life. Everybody doesn't need to be super rich, but I want to have a good life, and I want to feed my family healthy food. This is what I believe. And so, if we back it up for a second, why am I poor? Why are so many people now uh, in poverty, and and that those numbers are growing? And why do they disproportionately affect uh, a community, uh, one community um, more than others? then I think that you, you have to look at you know, jobs and, and opportunity to, to income, basically. And w w that's a larger conversation, but really, in this, especially in this city, we have to have more opportunity for people to have access to these foods. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's all, to me, is by, is by design. We'll talk about that later. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think <laughs> it's, you know, it's a, because here's what we talk about, right? When we talk about healthy, you know, I, I, don't, I try not to eat a lot, of, a lot of meat lately, right? My friends call me a fake vegan, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a vegan that eats meat. But <laughs> when, we, what? Um, when we talk about healthy, here's one thing that I, I remember a few years ago. When you talk about less soda, less meat, less carbohydrates even of the wrong stuff, and more plants and more farms, we are really threatening someone's billion dollar industry, right? A lot of people, I'm not gonna name any companies, I was about to say that, but there are a lot of people that do not 
like that talk. And, not, and they're not bad people necessarily. They're just looking out for their bottom line. So I think that's really important that when we talk about poverty, poor people spend a lot of money in this country um, on food, on these processed foods. So if you take that away and you talk about <coughs> buying seeds and putting gardens in the projects, you just threaten someone's livelihood, someone's legacy, someone's bottom line. So there are a lot of people that don't want to see that happen. So I think that's important to note that you know it, we have to work together on this, but there are some people that don't necessarily right now, tomorrow, don't want a bunch of gardens. So a lot of how, you know, a lot of healthy eating habits are traceable to childhood and how we learn to eat as children, what sort of foods we have access to as children. And Rock, you've written a book about teaching parents to cook healthy foods for their children. It, do you believe that's possible? How do you educate parents? And also, how do you educate children from an early age about eating well? Absolutely. One of the chapters in the book is, um, uh, I named the chapters after like quotes or uh, famous lines. One of them is, nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> right? Dirty dancing. So what, that, what, what we did, what we do, right, is we put our children in these corners. A palate. As a chef, your palate is your, it's just like as an artist, right? The more flavors you know, the more textures you know, the better chef you can become, right? The more, the more uh, masterpieces you can create. So what we do is we push them towards the peas and the mashed potatoes and the fish sticks and the chicken, and, and then your palate just becomes salt, sugar, fat, right? It's just, it's all the same thing, and then by the time you get to 15 years old, you, you just like, I'm not eating up broccoli without cheese? Like, what? what? What is bitter? What is sour? I don't want to eat that, right, in an American diet. So the, you start out by just letting them taste, and they're going to make these weird faces, but you start out just letting them taste and letting them explore, letting them see what naturally sweet is and naturally like bitter and, and earthy and all of these wonderful flavors we have through natural products and, let, and they'll become more accustomed and not reject it once we get older. Um, so I believe it can be done. The biggest thing is, the biggest chapter is, do not, as 44 things, just do one thing. We, 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 it's such a big thing, we do healthy eating and you gotta do this and you gotta, just try one thing, take it simple, Keep it easy, and um, I, I believe it can be done. It's just not so overwhelming. Just have fun with it. My grandmother had fun. Like my grandmother, be like, "What are you? What are you all doing?" You know, <laughs> you know, just have fun. So that's my take on it. Yeah. I, I love that. I'm I'm a historian, and I'm researching the history of children's food, and I can attest that American children did not used to be picky. The term picky eating did not exist before the 1930s, and earlier parents, if they had a worry about their children, it was not that they were picky. It was that they were too omnivorous. They were wanting to try everything. That's what childish eating was 100 years ago. It was childish greediness and curiosity. And I have 100% confidence, as well as you do, it sounds like, in children's ability to learn to eat a broad range of healthy foods. So They'll eat anything. Uh, going back to obesity, I think I have been seeing more articles lately that are expressing the idea that for, for people who are already obese to lose weight conventional diets don't work. And in fact, I have seen several times in really respected publications this idea being repeated that the only real cure, it seems, is bariatric surgery. And I'd be, Brian, especially interested in your perspective on this, because your whole career is devoted to behavior and choices and psychology. So what do you make of this idea? You know, Rock had an interesting point where he said, you know, there's a lot of people to, to lose if there's school gardens are planted, gardens are planted, because there's a lot of people who won't profit. Well, the same thing happens with obesity, too. There's a lot of various bariatric surgeons are going to lose if they're not doing a lot of surgery. And one of the things we find that, that's interesting is that I, I, I think being really super attuned to food, what we do is we, we hear the same 3% of the population talking about these issues all the time, because that's the 3% we hang around. We think that's the general viewpoint of the entire world. And if you put this, I'll give you a, a, a kind of a cool example. We did this study of this over 2,000 women, and we asked them these questions about how much weight would you need to lose to be happy with your weight, okay? And you kind of go, oh, my team, it's a lot of weight. Well, for 80% of the people, that, that figure was less than 16 pounds. Now, there are some people that really are overweight, and maybe something like that could be an alternative. But for the vast majority of us, we're about two pounds per month away from being one year for where we say we'll be happy with our weight. 
And, and, and that's not needing surgery. That's making one or two changes, exactly what you said. Moving that, putting that fruit bowl on the counter, getting that box of cereal that sits there every day off the counter, things like that. Um, as part of this exhibit in the Smithsonian on food, um, they're exploring governmental advice that has gone to Americans about what healthy eating is, especially food pyramids or food guides, visual um, expressions of health that we as Americans have, have grown up seeing. Um, how can we interpret the huge variations over time in what the government has said is healthy? Um, and how important do you think these recommendations are in, in actually affecting how people eat? I think a lot of the times they're just confusing for people. And we've all heard about how the different lobbies have very much influenced of which types of food get which spaces on the pyramid. There's a Lakota nutritionist, Kibi Conti, who has gone to native communities and developed new food wheels based on what did your diet used to look like and what were the types of proteins and carbs and then looking at what is your diet now, how can we develop a diet that is more um, of the nutritional components that your traditional diet was, but incorporating foods that you have easier access to. So elk is not something you can necessarily get <laughs> access to every day. What are other lean meats that you can put in that area? And so I think there are ways for communities to develop more meaningful food diagrams that they feel um, really contribute to something they can follow, as opposed to feeling like it's something it's imposed that has been influenced by food lobbies. Do you feel that, just to follow up on your response, do you feel that um, indigenous food traditions are usually compatible with good, healthy eating? Do you think that there are times where um, there have to be, where maybe indigenous people could contribute to recrafting of food guidelines because older traditions were in fact healthier? Yeah, I mean, I think people have taken aspects of indigenous diets to extremes sometimes. So like the Atkins diet, like, oh my God, all protein all the time. Well, people also had, you know, foraged and grown and there were, you know, farmers and gardeners in North America beforehand. Um, people had very complete, healthy diets most of the time. I mean, there were times of famine. I'm not gonna pretend that this was an amazing Eden where everybody had all the food all the time. Um, but there are movements now, you know, kind of the decolonize your diet to try to get back to some of those traditional foods. There are chefs, like the sous chef, um, Sean Sherman, who's working on showing people that there were beautiful foods pre-contact, kind of before dairy, before gluten. Um, and it's a matter of you know, places like Toka, the Tahona Odom Community Action in Arizona, in a desert where they still grow beautiful food, and they have a cafe there to show people that yes, there are still all these beautiful foods that you can be cooking. Um, if you can bypass some of the easier to cook. I mean, because peppery beans take a long time to cook. It's a lot easier to open a can sometimes. But trying to make people, again, aware of those foods. And they're marketing and making those accessible to other folks. So the, you know, up in White Earth, they're gathering up all this wild rice, which is really healthy and really tasty. And, you know, you can buy it from communities there through the Native Harvest website. People can buy wild rice. And so I think there is a movement where people are trying to incorporate more of these kinds of foods into their diets. You mentioned the Atkins diet, and Americans have such a unique history of vilifying certain ingredients, whether it is anti-fat or anti-carbs or anti-gluten, or now I think we're having a big anti-sugar movement moment. Um, is, does this point to a sort of dysfunction in American eating that we don't have a stable underlying food culture? Or is this actually sort of a uniquely informed Popu population level response to dietary advice? I think it's uh, much of it, much of what the trends that you, you just um, stated, they're, they're driven by profit, um, they're driven by money. And we are great marketers in this country. And, uh, you know, I don't know why we need so much. The research that I've done, and it's out there, why, why do we, need the milk, right? It does your body good? I think that was just a, I don't know how many year farce. Um, why do we need some, you know, as an American man, I'm supposed to be all beefy, 200 grams of protein. I remember I was on the Atkins one time, and I'm eating all this chicken. I'm like, this can't be natural. <laughs> <laughs> and then recently, I, I went to, um, you know, I tried a vegan diet. I did this little 22-day thing, and it, it, it's almost no protein. And I feel great. And I'm wondering, you know, my doctor's like, you're fine. You're good. So where did this pro what is this driven by this protein thing? And it's anti-sugar thing. I'm always really skeptical about these huge movements 
uh, you know, you look behind, you look behind, you look behind, and you see that it's driven by someone that just wants to drive you to something else. Um, especially being a chef, we get, these, we get these brokers that come in and, and push product. And if you look behind that, uh, many times you'll see that it's not driven by your, your well-being or they, they care about you. They just want to push you to a new product because this crop is, uh, is going out or this country, we already we depleted that. So now we're going to push this on you. It's almost like, uh, you know, it's dope dealers or something. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> and listen, it, it's, it, it's, it's sad, but um, if, if you do some, some research behind it, I don't know why we need so much milk. That's, that's just my take on it. And why do we need so much protein? Well, if you ask the, uh, the dairy and, the, um, and the, 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 the meat people, they'll probably tell you a good re couple good reasons why. Um, we are inside a museum that tells, uh, that tells stories about food through objects. Can you think of an object that, for you, encapsulates something important about food and health? So I have a, a friend, Natasha Smoke Santiago, who's a, an artist from Aquisesne, and she works in all different media, and I saw mm -hmm. one of her pieces recently um, took an aspect of the Mohawk creation story, so Sky Woman, but she made her out of insulin bottles as a way of trying to dramatize the, the rates of diabetes in the community. Mm -hmm. But then she's also surrounded by um, plant leaves to represent corn, beans, and squash. And so it's a way of saying, okay, here's the current health problem in this community. You know, American Indians have the highest rates of diabetes of any ethnic group in the country, but the answer to moving away from that is looking back toward these traditional foods and the types of things that people ate before. So it was just a really stunning piece that was kind of like, wow, this really sums up kind of the problem and the solution. So I think it's important to consider both at the same time. So I just got here about 20 minutes before the talk started, so I didn't get much of a chance to look at the exhibits. But the exhibit, I think, that characterizes and sums up everything related to food, nutrition, and politics is the one I saw right next to the cash register in the gift store. And that is 57 different kinds of beanie babies, or not beanie babies, jelly bellies. <laughs> that you can buy. Because right? <laughs> what that shows is that here you get stuff that's incredibly cheap, it's incredibly attractive, and it looks incredibly normal to purchase because it's just sitting right there. Now, available food, affordable food, and um, attractive food is nothing that any of us want to get rid of. And to try to think that it can get politicized out of our taste is, is really, really going to be difficult to do. And when it comes down to it, it ends up being a lot of things end up being consumer driven and not sort of top down pushed. So it's more of a demand world than it is a supply world. Um, I'm, I'm going to go a little, I mean, I don't know how to follow up the jelly bellies, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, what, what, kinda, what sticks out to me here was the, the warm reception I got from everyone, um, from the people that were. I guess on security, and uh, you know everyone here. So we're, we're, we're trying to solve a, a common problem, I, I would say, and just the people, the, the love. Love is very important to me, and people, and I think that is the most important piece in any, in it when we're trying to you know reach a certain goal. So when we were talking about the overall solution, when it, it's just so many answers and so many things we can do. I'm just every time I think about it, I just think about. You know, it's not one general diet or solution. It's just about, you know, let's center ourselves and connect with people on a, on a very deep and um, almost a spiritual level. And, and, and we can get through this thing, and it's not one blanket thing, but um, it's the people really stick out to me. Cool. Um, when it comes to the politics of health and nutrition, how much of our food system depends on the government recommending or not recommending certain things to us. And do you think that we should do a better job of incorporating diverse American regional cuisines or ethnic cuisines or different community cuisines into what we think of as healthy eating? <laughs> Um, I think some people don't care what the government recommends. They're eating what's available to them because, you know, if, if you're the, the single mother who doesn't have a kitchen, you're eating what you can and it doesn't matter to you what the government says is good or bad. So I think it's about supporting communities and developing local food systems. And so 
you know, in a lot of the American Indian communities I work with, so the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance just had a big meeting about how do you support different tribal projects um, to get, you know, off the ground, different gardening projects, different, um, you know, people developing herds of animals, that kind of thing, and helping people to have regional foods that make sense for them as opposed to the government deciding for the entire country of very diverse people what everyone should eat. I don't think it should be a one size fits all. I think each community should figure out what makes them feel good and feel healthy. And part of that is um, supporting the environment that is necessary to produce healthy food. And so, you know, the, the book that I just finished is about a community that's downstream from a Superfund site that took over 20 years and will never be fully clean up. So how do you then ensure food safety there? Or for people who are at Standing Rock right now, because they're trying to put a pipeline under the river upstream from their community that will pollute the water. And you can't have healthy people without healthy water. You can't grow healthy food without healthy water. And instead of people supporting them, people are out there, they're being shot with bean bags and tear gassed and being sent off to prison because we're more supportive of a pipeline that will carry energy through as opposed to people who are trying to defend their water. And so I think rather than the government deciding who should eat where what, it's about how do we support the environment in each of these places so that people have access to safe food and healthy food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we think about the environmental toxicity of our food or what affects our food, um, of course one of the big things that people think about is synthetic pesticides and herbicides um, and fertilizers. Um, and that's been the basis of the organic foods movement. How important do you think it is integrating discussions about dietary health as we usually understand it, which is the choices you make about the sort of fattiness or the junk food, you know, what you're eating, with um, broader questions about the environment and about toxins, but also about um, herbicides and pesticides? I think it's, I don't want to dominate here if anybody else has something to say, but I think it's really important that we can't talk about sustainability of food movements without talking about sustainability of the land that it's coming from and just you know, looking at the body burdens of people. You know, infants are born with toxins in their systems already and everybody's breast milk has toxins in it and there's no way of avoiding it and we're continuing to accumulate those things. You know, toxins that were banned are still circulating through your fat cells, every one of you in here right now. And so while those are continuing to be dumped on the food, people are continuing to store those in their body and that leads to other health problems on top of eating unhealthy food. And so, you know, if you don't have the proper immune system to be fighting off other things, we're seeing all kinds of elevated health issues. So I think it's a really important part of the discussion that we not continue to input things that are winding up in our bodies. Yeah, this past year I had a sabbatical and I, I, I elected to take it and move to, to Norway for the winter, um, <laughs> for, the, for the whole year. But to, to, to work with a, a nonprofit organization called the, the Eat Forum that we had focused on sustainability as it relates to food. And, and the powerful thing about sustainability is that you say, well, geez, is that really something I'm that interested in? You know, I believe it's a huge issue simply if you expand it to include not only just the sustainability of our systems and our planet, but the sustainability of us as individuals. And there's so many things that can be done easily by us as individuals. But I, I, I would be afraid that too much of a discussion on pesticides and herbicides and things like this could really spin things in a direction that would take a lot of people don't really aren't really that informed in, in the area and give them just enough knowledge to be really super dangerous, where there's a lot of other things that they could do that they could make a lot more progress on a lot faster and a lot more productively. So. Pretty soon, in, in just a few minutes, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please write on one of the cards. Um, people will be coming through to collect them. Or you can tweet, um, hashtag Smithsonian Food, any questions uh, that you might have. I, I, I want to take this chance to ask you about a question that I find personally um, really kind of puzzling, that I grapple with a lot. One is that. Um, Obesity is a big problem in America. There are a lot of very serious diseases correlated with obesity. Um, we know that the way that many Americans eat harms their health and shortens their life expectancy. At the same time, 
I think there is an enormous amount of anti-fat stigma and bias that, that really, to me, resembles bigotry. How do, we, how do we reconcile these two things? For me, uh, this is a little, maybe, here's what I do when I tell people, wow, Chef Rock, I want to lose weight. OK, here's what you got to do. First of all, you have to, and this was a personal journey for me, you have to be OK. I got to be OK with where I am right now. I literally have to stand in front of the mirror naked. Sorry for the imagery. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is what I tell people. Be grateful. And this is sort of, this is just me. Be grateful for where we are. We're not all supposed to look the same. We're not all supposed to. We just weren't built the same. This BMI chart is just, who made that? Who made that thing? Who came up with it? But we have to, one, start being grateful with our bodies and what, is it, what, what it's done for us. Um, and, and if it's time for it to go, if it's time for this, you know, this to go, it's time for it to go. But one, what that does is it makes us, everyone, okay and comfortable in their skin. And also we can move forward knowing that, because I've worked out really hard a lot of times. I just don't look like Edris Elba. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't, you know, I, this will never happen. <laughs> but it just doesn't happen. So I, I'm okay with, at the end of the day, when I know I'm eating right and I'm walking right and I'm living right and I'm, you know, and I'm meditating, this is where I look. So I think it just starts with saying that this, you know, we're not all meant to look alike and then moving forward after that. That's good. You know, that's, that's a great question, and I think a, a while back, I, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have a ton of people in my, in my Cornell Food and Brand Lab who come, and we'll just volunteer for a year, they'll take a gap year and work. But about a third of the people who come, and, uh, about a third of the people who come and work with me end up being, having eating disorders of one sort or another. And I, I, it's been interesting what causes this, and one of the things that we've done is we've looked back and we've asked Oh, this is about a thousand, uh, 500 women between the ages of 20 and 35, um, what they remember from their youth growing up, and then asking them how satisfied they are with their weight and stuff like this. And we find that if people, if we, these women remember their either parent saying anything about their weight when they're growing up, they're less satisfied with their weight now as an adult, they're <laughs> likely to count calories, and uh, they're, they're more dissatisfied in general. But this is even woman to woman, people who have, who are, have a normal weight and have, and have the exact same BMI as a woman whose mom and dad never said anything about her weight growing up. So you can talk about the food people eat, but you can't talk about the weight when they're little girls. And you have to think of a much more intelligent way to do it than apparently they did it 20 to 35 years ago. It's a great question, thank you. No, and I mean, in the discussions I've had with my students around this topic, and I have a, a student who's working on a, a project looking at kind of discrimination against people perceived as, as fat and how fatness is perceived. And, you know, in discussing BMI, it's more, you know, how, at what weight do you feel good? When do you feel good in your body? When are you able to accomplish what you would like to accomplish, whether that's running, moving, not, whatever it is, you know, what food can you eat that makes you feel good? Um, and that's, you know, we tend to focus more on that than, as you said, BMI, you know, how do you apply the same standard to every single person regardless of bone structure and, you know, physiognomy, so, yeah. Thank you. I think we will have to turn it over now to questions. Well, um, you know, Adrian wrote a book on uh, soul food, and what I think we miss a lot of times, especially with the, you know, the Food Network and all of these programs are sort of just bastardized, you know, certain parts of our, our, our food culture. We miss what was around, like when you talk about barbecue, when you talk about 
you know, now we can order barbecue through the mail, or Uber can bring it, right? <laughs> okay, 20 pounds of brisket and 40 pounds of mac and cheese. And my grandmother lived, God bless her, till she was 95 years old. We had barbecues, what, what, what you don't, I think it's really important to answer the question. In short, what, we, what we've taken away is what happens around the barbecue, the three, four days that the lead up to part. it, the yeah. fellowship that happens, the church, mm -hmm. the walking to someone, you make this and you make that, so mm -hmm. this is the spiritual, the social, we just miss the stuff because we've become so automatic, right? The millennials are like, what are you, what are you talking about? I'm gonna order from Red Hot and Blue right now. You know, I'm, I got uh, 6,000 emails to, to, to write and then we'll have a barbecue and then we'll go do brunch and, then, and that's fine. And that's cool, right? But we miss, barbecue is important. I don't want everybody to be vegan like Russell Simmons, right? I love Russell Simmons, but what we miss is everything around the barbecue that happened uh, when it, when when it when it came about, so that's does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's yeah. the social health that yeah. we were talking about social earlier, health. and you know, within American Indian communities, a lot of this reclamation of different foods are okay. These foods, you know, I mentioned corn beans and squash, are featured in the creation story. So there's a connection to that food, and people say this is why we have to get back to eating these foods because we don't tell these stories, we don't talk about the Thanksgiving address, we don't use these languages unless we're eating these foods. So it connects in all of these different ways. It's not about are you getting enough antioxidants in your diet, is you know, are we still having the same foods at ceremonies and are they still being incorporated in the same way? So I think there are you know, broader social cultural implications around that. struck by the smaller portions in restaurants as well as the limited amount of takeout options. Is this due to a uniquely American culture or due to the fact that we simply have different ideas of what it means to be full here? Let me take that one. Uh, one thing is that we become very normed as to what we expect that we need to be full. We also can become very normed as to what's appropriate because if it's not what the competition's doing across the street, well, we're gonna go to the competition. So insofar as there's an arms race of portion size in the US that isn't overseas, we end up being, in some ways, the beneficiaries in terms of calories per dollar, but we also end up gaining a lot of weight. Now, I don't know how anybody can afford to eat in Norway. I mean, we, we got just, it got to the point that we'd say, we're never gonna go out to eat unless it's a really good place, because it's so ridiculously expensive. So we're blessed with that here in the United States. And they aren't over there because there isn't the same predominance of chains around that give us the ability to compare portion sizes and what we think is going to be the right portion size. We have a question also about meals that are provided by the government itself, school lunches, military meals, and other meals of that form from institutions. What responsibility does the government have to making those meals not just meet USDA standards, but go above and beyond in providing healthy food? Well, only if we want smart, healthy children, right? I mean, <laughs> if, we, if we want a well-informed citizenry uh, who you know, understands what their food can and should look like, that for some kids, you know, the meals that they get are the meals that are provided through these kinds of programs. And so if we want people to grow up healthy, strong, and not obese, then I think it's really important that these you know, meals be nutritionally complete. Those programs are powerfully important, and they have plenty of healthy options that are there. The problem is getting the child to pick up the apple instead of the cookie. And if the stuff's already been provided, we can't necessarily too easily mandate what they eat. But what we can do is we can set up lunchrooms in a way so that it makes it a lot easier for the child to pick up an apple instead of a cookie. It makes it a lot more attractive for them to pick up a white milk carton that's in front of them rather than have to wait in line in a bottleneck and back of the line to pick up a chocolate milk carton. And a lot of this is being done right now. We've got a program called the Smarter Lunchroom Program, and it's already in 29,000 schools, which directs food service directors to make these small changes to their, their environments that cost no money that can guide kids toward those healthier foods. If I can just couple on that, it's, it's the government, I don't know if we, you know, they have a huge responsibility in it. And they, get the, get, the, get the vending machines out of the cafeteria. There's no need for them to be there. There's no need for, if we're really talking about schools, so many children, especially in Washington, D.C., have, they only, 
meals that they'll eat are at school. So we're talking about breakfast, lunch, dinner. Sometimes we, we even have programs where we have after school like dinner. That's all they'll eat. You can't, I don't say you can't tell me, DC Central Kitchen is doing it. So many other programs are doing it as well. When you cook, all you gotta do is make the food taste good, right? So when, you, when I'm faced with you know, the cafeteria's uh, canned collard greens that have nothing in them, came out of the can, versus a cookie, I'm going with the cookie. You're going with the cookie. <laughs> put some flavor in there, put some love in there, and get the junk out of the cafeteria. The same thing in prison. Right? We have to follow, you know, this is a, this is a community that they don't have a choice. Yeah. Right? And we say that, and then there's some groups will say, oh, they should have a choice. If we really want to rehabilitate ways. people and lead them into a, 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 you know, a, a better lifestyle or, a, you know, uh, better choices when they come out, then the government, they can do it by these guidelines, and they can say, here's, here's what, there's a lot of people that don't want to see that happen. So there's a huge responsibility, and they could do it. But again, profit drives everything, so that means that somebody's going to make a, a lot less money if, if that happens. So we have two connected questions. Um, we talked a little bit about how you need time to be able to cook a real meal. How do we encourage people to cook if there is no one home to do the cooking? And then simultaneously, how has our experience of healthy food changed as the type of work we do has changed and the work schedule has changed? I think part of it is educating kids through programs how to cook. So for example, Dream of Wild Health is a program north of Minneapolis that takes urban kids and teaches them how to farm and garden, but then also how to cook this food. So if the, you know, the kids are home, if they're latchkey kids, they're not eating Hot Pockets if they know how to cook. And it also provides them with some of these kitchen implements, because as you were saying, if you don't have a knife and a cutting board, you're gonna have a hard time with fresh ingredients. And so I think it's important that you know, if, if parents are really busy, the kids should know how to cook anyway. I, I work with college students all the time who don't have a clue as how to uh, grocery shop and, and cook and how to cut things up. And by the time you get to that age, you should have some notion. So I think it's you know, educating kids to be helping their parents in the kitchen that way. Yeah, that, that's great. One of the things we ended up kind of finding in one of the studies, we, we timed a bunch of people's dinners, how long it took them to make dinner. And it takes the typical person about, about on average for dinner, about 35 minutes to make a dinner kind of from scratch, okay? It includes cleanup and this. If you um, don't make it from scratch, you use kind of instant food, microwave food, things like this. By the time you set the table, clean up and everything, it takes about 23 minutes. So it doesn't take, it takes about two thirds the amount of time to not cook that it does to actually cook. And so I have dinner parties all the time, and I, but I also forget I'm having them, and I go, oh my gosh, it's quarter to six, and people are coming over at 6.30. And a number of years ago, I bought this kind of very, very funny book. It's got, it's got a funny title, but it's, it's about how to make meals uh, using semi-prepared food. It's called A Man, a Can, and a Plan. <laughs> I know. You're just, you're just, you're, 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 you're going, I want to punch him. <laughs> but I, I know that, that that has been very useful for me a bunch of times in, in making things just really fast. We can kind of go, oh my gosh, people are coming over in 25 minutes. So it can be, it can be done. You have to go to dinner at your house. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it, it, often, it also just takes some degree of, of confidence in yourself, self-efficacy, that you can do it, it's not gonna be a disaster. I, I think we are 15 meals away from having a whole different country. If we had people say, look, for the next 15 meals in a row, you need to cook something from scratch, and it's gotta be a little bit different every day. In the end of two weeks, we'd have an entire country of people who really felt empowered because they'd made spaghetti. They knew how to bake chicken. They grilled a steak and burned it. So I don't, I don't think we're very far away from that confidence that people need. We just don't want to do it. Can I add something to this as well? I think a, a huge amount you hear popularly, um, the decline of American cooking is because women entered the workforce in the 1970s, and it's all been downhill since there. And that, that historically, it just doesn't hold up. You know, the, the food industry was roaring into popularity in the 1950s when, when relatively few women were working and had more time. Um, I think so much of it comes down to confidence and also competence, like legitimately knowing basic kitchen skills. And of course you need supplies and you know, there are certain limitations. 
I am a huge advocate for reviving home economics into the public school system. I, real quick, got my start, home ec. I made lasagna, went home, loved it. Everybody loved it. I made this outfit too, I'm a bull. I'm a bull. It's the worst thing ever. I made this Bulls, I'm a Bulls fan. I had these red shorts, black. I wore it like two weeks later. My friends, uh, they, Oh, they cracked on me so hard. Never made clothes again. <laughs> got my start in home ec, though. We got to teach food in schools. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So since you're all full of great ideas, we're going to end the day on this great question. You know, we've heard a lot about the problems that face our food system today and have been in American food for a long, long time. Uh, what are the solutions? Is the answer more regulation? a different method of education, something else altogether. You've touched on a couple, but it's a good chance to sum up. I think it's, it's education, it's empowering local communities. Like I said, I don't think it can be a one size fits all for everybody, for every community, for every culture kind of thing, but if there are community programs that are helping people to plant gardens, to learn how to cook food, um, you know, and, and environmental, you know, taking care of the environment, so taking out dams that are preventing fish from getting back to communities where they were, cleaning up Superfund sites, um, not allowing pipelines to produce, you know, pollute water. I think that there are all these different levels without necessarily telling people what they have to be eating. You can be providing the right environment for people to be able to make those healthier choices. Yeah, there's five places where we purchase or eat all of 82% of our food, and it's our homes, it's just a handful, our homes, so our one or two most frequented restaurants, not our favorite, the ones we go to most frequently. For me, it's McDonald's. Okay, it's where we shop, it's where we work and where our kids go to school. And I spent a lot of time developing blueprints of what could be done, what could be changed that are win-win solutions for those environments and for us. Changes that can make a restaurant more money, getting us to eat healthy, so that they benefit also. And so that was actually, the reason I went over to Norway is to implement these in grocery stores. It's actually in the book Slim by Design, which will be signing in four minutes, I guess. Um, I think, uh, you know, people want to eat healthy, and we just have to give them opportunity to, to ensure, and I don't know how to say it, people need to make, in D.C., people need to make more money. Um, and, yeah, mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, if you have a little bit more money, you can eat a little, a little healthier, all right? And if you have two days off a week, maybe they're consecutive, you can meal prep and have some confidence behind that. So it's an employer situation like Wegmans. Um, I think Wegmans is a great grocery store here locally, and they're all up and down, where they give you, like, um, ready-to-cook stuff, right? So it's a little pricier, but it's not super expensive. Um, so it makes it approachable when you don't have the confidence. You see this little recipe, and for maybe six, seven dollars a person, um, it's, it's not really cheap. But you can you have the confidence to put something together. So it's an employee, and the way they treat their employees is great too. By the way, um, I don't know if that's a you know unfair plug or whatever, but hey, I love Wegmans. <laughs> um, and for restaurants, restaurants like us, for instance, you know, you, we work a lot in restaurants, and we're at the Howard Theater, so it's a, it's an entertainment venue. It's everybody having this approach. It's not this one size fits all. I love that. Where we can do stuff like, you can purchase groceries if you're an employee, right? So milk, eggs, bread. If we sell it to you at wholesale cost or maybe a little bit above that, that's, that's, a, that's a step we can take as an employer where it just makes it, it's a benefit. It's a, you know, where you can come to work and you know you can buy some of these things for your family. You don't make a whole lot of money, but that's something small, doesn't cost us a bunch. Um, so just everybody doing something really small where they are uh, to contribute to, um, you know, to making it easier to, to eat healthy. Just two more things related to time. One, we need a living wage in this country so that people don't have to work two or three jobs to support their families. Two, mm -hmm. we also need a reconceptualization for those people who aren't working two or three jobs because a lot of people say they don't have time to cook, but they do spend, you know, multiple hours a day watching television or surfing the internet. And people might not want to hear that, but that's true and that's new. And so I think both of those aspects, ha we do have the time to cook if we, if we look for it. Thank you very much.
so much to our amazing panel. Great way to close out what I um, can confidently say was an incredible day for all of us. Thank you to all of our panelists today. Most importantly, thank all of you for joining us. Um, and Helen and Brian, as Brian plugged, will be out in the lobby signing their books. And we hope that you will all continue the conversation tonight with one of the many restaurants around DC participating in our Dine Out for Food History event. Uh, over 25 restaurants are putting special Julia Child inspired dishes on their menus. Proceeds from those dishes come back to the museum to support our food history programming. And uh, you got to have a delicious meal while supporting the museum. And um, right after this, we invite you all to go over to our Coulter Plaza where you can see some of those programs that we do every day for the public in action. Um, and to those, of us who, to those of you who registered for our happy hour to continue the conversation, please join us in the Coulter, or sorry, in the SU Johnson Conference Center. There'll be ushers to help you over there in the lobby. A big thank you to our entire team here at the museum who made this all possible. And we look forward to seeing you all tonight out at dinner and tomorrow for more Food History Weekend festivities. Thank you all and a huge thank you to our final panel. Thank you.